What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Apologize if the energy is a little bit down right now. I'm filming this like 13 seconds after the Cam Akers torn Achilles injury news. I uh, made a couple videos on that yesterday. So if you're new to the channel, you can go bike on my channel and just search Cam Akers. I'm sure about a zillion videos will pop up because I've talked about him about 240 times in the 30 videos I put out this summer. But uh, if you want the instant reaction to Cam Akers injury yesterday, we did it. We need to sh we need to get away from the running backs or else I'll get too, uh, too emotional here. Today we're talking about wide receivers. We're going to build upon yesterday's video, which was five running backs in 2021 fantasy football that have elite upside. And now we're switching tune over to wide receivers. Today, we're looking at five guys, five wide receivers, shout out the burger store, that have elite fantasy football upside in 2021. I've got a, I've got a button down. Oh, my belt's undone. I'm getting frisky for y'all already. Y'all know the deal. We got to tuck our shirts in. <sighs> We're going to stop yelling. What we're already doing. Let's eat. <laughs> First guy up on this list should come as no surprise from my from my Dirty Birds roster. Yes, I'm a Falcons fan. Don't ask me how I became a Falcons fan. Calvin Ridley, elite route runner. Calvin Ridley, currently the odds-on favorite per this place you might have heard of, Las Vegas, to lead the NFL in receiving yards. That is insane. Found that stat out like three days ago. Didn't realize he was that highly regarded. Obviously, the opportunity is there with Julio gone. And we we actually have a, a nice sizable sample of what Calvin Ridley has done without Julio Jones in the lineup, okay? So the last 2 years we have an 8 game split without Julio on the lineup. And here it is. This guy's averaging over 20 PPR fantasy points per game without Julio. Right side is without Julio, left side in split is with Julio. Uh if he gets those touchdown numbers up, man, you're looking at 7.25 receptions, over 11 targets per game, 107 107 receiving yards. Those are like literally Julio type numbers by himself. The touchdown numbers a little bit lower, but if those go up, man, if those go up, you have Arthur Smith coming over as the new head coach. He's a genius, he's a wizard in the red zone. Calvin Ridley is going to be unstoppable this year, right? I'm not telling you anything. It was pretty Pretty simple. This passing offense is going to run directly through him. He's an elite separator and route runner already. He's young. The only thing that was keeping him away from a 30% or more target share was Julio. And Julio is gone. Ridley finishing this year as the overall wide receiver one in fantasy isn't even a weird thing to say anymore. It's not even a hot take. I feel like most people probably have him ranked inside their top three, four, five at the latest. So Calvin Ridley, elite upside this year in fantasy football. It's it's wheels so far fucking up for Calvin Ridley. We don't even need front tires, all right? Calvin Ridley, unbelievable upside, really high floor as well. So he's just good all-around pick, and you're seeing him move further and further up in underdogs ADP. Start of the year out as like a third-round pick, fourth-round pick prior to Julio. Even after the Julio trade, he was still going like early third, late second. And uh, I think you can argue him all the way up into like the Stefan Diggs territory, right? Early second round right now. And that's, that's about where his ADP is, but his elite upside is certainly factored into there. After Calvin Ridley, we're going to move down the ADP list a little bit to that end of the second, early third round turn where these young, primed up, sliced up, sizzled up wide receivers have already broken out, but we're looking for them to take that elite step. And there are three guys that I want to briefly touch on, but there's one of them that I'm a little bit higher on than the other two in terms of just overall raw elite upside. Okay. When th this video is about upside, this video is not really about weighing risk with upside. I'm not telling you, oh, he becomes a good pick or you should reach up for him because his upside is so high, right? We're not really talking about the risks here. I just want to let you know who I think has absolutely elite upside this year in fantasy football. I'm talking about the DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, Justin Jefferson tier. Right now, they are the wide receivers six, seven, and eight in ADP. They're kind of going after those running backs in the second tier, right? You have the elite running backs, and then you get into the early second, mid-second round, and you're looking at guys like Joe Mixon, rest in peace to Cam Akers, Aaron Jones, Najee Harris, Clyde, right? And then these wide receivers start to go off the board just naturally because people like wide receivers less than they like running backs. They're a lot less enticing. But these guys, these guys are unbelievably talented. They're all young. They're athletic. They're entering their prime. They've already broken out. So we're not projecting here, right? We're not projecting. It's just a quick, quick elevator ride up to the top for these guys if they take a step up from what they've already done in their NFL careers. What is probably subconsciously holding all three of those guys bike in the ADP is their respective offenses, right? They're all in run first offenses. Tennessee last year, third lowest pass rate in the NFL. Minnesota, sixth lowest pass rate in the NFL. And Seattle, surprisingly, is an interesting case. They were actually above average in path, pass rate. They were 14th in overall plays 
being passes in terms of percentage, likely due to the start of their season when they were on fire and they were, as people with no personality like to say, let letting Russ cook. Okay. The case, the case for all three of these guys, super, super easy, right? Jefferson, absolutely dumb, dumb fucking rookie year, 1400 yards after not even really playing the first few weeks of the season, elite, elite, already elite route runner. Uh, you look at Matt Harmon's reception perception. He's literally in like the 95th percentile in terms of the separator versus man versus press. And while this is a run first offense, the passing game is an absolute target funnel, right? Jefferson averaged 10 targets a game over the second half of the year. He needed to get accustomed to being the one in this offense, right? He didn't play much of the first two, three weeks. Uh, he was averaging like five to six targets a game game over the first eight games of the season and then he went absolutely nuts 10 targets per game you look at that volume and you project it out to the rest of the year the math is it's quite simple 10 targets a game 16 games 16 160 targets 17 games 170 targets and if some of those red zone targets right one of the one of the things holding you back is obviously adam thielen adam thielen's been a great receiver great fantasy receiver if you got him in dynasty a few years back, he, he gave you everything and more that you could have invested into him Great red zone option, right? Still very much a good red zone option. But in terms of like targets, receptions, receiving yards, he ranked like 25th in those categories. So I don't expect him to be a huge factor in fantasy this year. Be a great low end wide receiver two, a high end wide receiver three. But Jefferson uh, upside, if he starts to take some of those red zone looks away from Adam Thielen is sky high. And we actually saw that over the second half of the year as Jefferson continued to get more and more involved in the offense. His red zone targets and his 10 zone targets started shooting up in terms of just his overall involvement in the offense down the, down there. And if he scores, you know, 10 to 12 touchdowns instead of 10, uh, instead of seven, you're looking at an elite finish amongst the fantasy wide receivers. Thielen turned 13 10 zone targets into 10 touchdowns. That's an unreal rate. Uh, he's great down there. Jefferson went one for eight inside the 10 zone. I expect that to shoot up. I expect him to, to meet somewhere in the middle there. And I think more touchdowns are coming Justin Jefferson's way because this is just an efficient offense overall that's going to move smoothly. And same thing for A.J. Brown, right? I know Julio is added to the mix, but Corey Davis and Jonah Smith are both gone, which which equates to like 26, 28% of the target share in that offense last year, which is where Julio will probably step into. Some of those will go to A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown, this is the crazy thing about A.J. Brown. This is why you look at the, the addition of Julio and you immediately say like, okay, A.J. Brown will probably do around what he did last year. A.J. Brown finished as the wide receiver six in fantasy last year in points per game he did that on 106 targets he had 106 targets last year and finishes the wide receiver six in points per game okay he did that he did that on such limited targets because he is such an opposing wide receiver on any area of the field right his yak is unreal he'll go up for contested catches he can catch anything and do anything with the ball once he does make those plays imagine this man gets real wide receiver one type targets even like low end wide receiver one type targets 130 140 targets dare i say 150 targets remember he played with two fucking sliced up knees last year he had to get surgery this offseason okay two of them both knees he said he came out and said i should have stopped playing after week one because of the knee injuries but he did not and he finishes a wide receiver six in fantasy points per game i think we're under uh, underestimating just how freakishly talented athletically gifted this dude aj brown is if aj brown sees 150 targets this year 140 targets this year i mean he's averaged 12.5 and 10 yards per target in his first two years so at a minimum you're looking at probably 10 yards per target because this guy is just so good with the ball in his hands but whatever the target numbers are just multiply it by 10 that's going to be his yardage you want to have a good efficient year multiply it by 11 multiply it by 12 because that's what he did in his rookie year you're looking at massive 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 numbers right he can easily turn 130 targets which is not out of the realm of possibilities even with julio there even in uh run first offense 130 targets easily turns that into 1500 yards probably double digit touchdowns okay but i will say this and we're about to get into the fucking weeds we're about to get into the big facts if there's one of these guys i'm going to choose to be absolutely elite and finish as the overall wide receiver one this year in fantasy it's actually dk metcalf before we do so before we get into the dk metcalf propaganda if you're new to the channel i would appreciate it i would love it for you to scroll down and hit the button that says subscribe. It's a big, actually, it might not even be a button. I think right now it's just outline text in red. But if it says subscribe, if it says subscribe and not subscribed, let's, let, let's, let's pull some man shit and put the D in it. All right, subscribe to the channel and you'll be following me along for the rest of the summer. I'll try to give you the best fantasy football advice I could possibly give, which isn't very good. It's not upside like these guys. But I do my best. I do my research and I present the big facts to you. So if at any point in the video you find out something you didn't know before, hit the thumbs up button. And subscribe. The entire story of Tyler Lockett. See, I, th I think it's I think it's important to tell the picture of the Seattle Seahawks offense, and not just sit here and tell you about how athletically gifted DK Metcalf is, right? Because we could we could do that for an hour. The entire story of Tyler Lockett season. Uh, was the lack of consistency. But that was the case for basically the entire Seattle offense, right? Both Wilson and Metcalf fell off uh, after the first half of the year, too. And these are Metcalf splits in weeks one through nine versus weeks 10 through 17, eight games on both sides of it. 
Weeks one through eight is on the right side. Look at those numbers. Uh, like, I don't have to tell you that his first half pace of the season, which would have been a 16-game pace of 136 targets, 86 catches, 1,576 receiving yards, and 16 touchdowns. I don't have to tell you would have ranked pretty high in fantasy, okay? Wide receiver three behind Adams and about a half a point behind Tyreek Hill. 21.23 PPR fantasy points per game. 18.5 half PPR fantasy points per game. The dude is literally averaging one touchdown per game and 99 receiving yards per game. Now, when we take a look at Russell Wilson's first half splits, unbelievable in the first eight weeks of the season, averaging 37.12 pass attempts per game. That dropped by almost five over the second half of the season. Passing touchdowns went from 3.5 down to 1.5, 318 passing yards down to 209 passing yards over the second half of the season. And things are going to change there in Seattle. And we'll get to that in a second. But one of the points I want to get across here is what people have this thought of when it comes to DK Metcalf. The narrative around DK Metcalf, I feel like, and why he fell off last year, people don't like to look at Russ. They don't like to look at his offense. They don't say, oh, Russ fell off. His his passing yards were terrible, right? We just think of Russ as one of the most accurate pinpoint best quarterbacks in the NFL. We don't take into account just how fucking good DK Metcalf actually was as a player. People think they the defenses have him figured out, right? All he, all he does is run downfield, double coverage him, make sure he doesn't catch the deep balls, and that's the end of the story for DK Metcalf. But that cannot be any further from the truth because, again, we go back to Matt Harmon's Reception Perception, one of my favorite resources in the fantasy football space. You can go copy right now, receptionperception.com. It looks at the percentile in terms of success rate on different routes, uh, on different coverages, and DK Metcalf's success rate versus man, 88th percentile in the history of Reception Perception versus press. 94th percentile in the history of reception perception. Those numbers always equate to elite seasons. Like those are really, really high versus man versus press. And that is separation on all different types of routes. Okay. This was a quote. This is quoted from Matt Harmon's reception perception. And he's probably going to be pissed if I keep just giving away all of his free shit or all of his paid stuff. But that's what we do here. We're given, we're, we're acting as the intermediary. We're the middleman, right? You no longer need a drug dealer because we are the drug dealer injecting the shit into your veins for you. We're giving you the big facts because everybody else does does it better so we just try to weed out all the no pun intended we try to weed out all the all the bad shit and give you straight cocaina none of that late stuff fentanyl bullshit here all right the seahawks had metcalf in a limited role as a rookie while he grew into his paws weird selection of words there man the team started to open things up for him last year his nine route rate 22.9 percent went down okay so he was running less less routes down the field while his comeback 5.2 percent and dig rate 11.5 percent shot up he posted above average success rates on both patterns no one should dare bring any more questions about Metcalf's ability as a full field route runner. Those are so beyond played out. Metcalf has the route running profile of a true alpha receiver and made big jumps from year one to year two. Metcalf is becoming an elite separator on a multitude of routes. He is not just a deep guy uh, and is flying under the radar because of how they finished the season. You might look at Wilson's numbers last year and be like, yeah, he fell off like Maybe he's not that great of a fantasy option. But Wilson set career highs last year in completions, in pass attempts, in completion rate, passing touchdowns, and fantasy points. If I told you that at the beginning of the year, you would not be down on him whatsoever. And everything we're hearing out of Seattle in terms of new offense coordinator Shane Waldron is that it's going to be a much more high-tempo, up-tempo offense, which means more pass attempts. You don't go up-tempo, high-tempo, and run the ball more. Seahawks, over the last three years, which is what's been capping Wilson's upside, even though he still threw for 40 fucking touchdowns last year, uh, you look at the last three years. 2020, neutral game script pace, rank, okay? So we're looking at the pace of their offense, like how quickly they hurried up, how quickly they ran plays in neutral game scripts, okay? Because these things can get skewed. If a team is up by 14, obviously they're going to hurry up a little, or they're going to slow down a little bit more. If they're down by 22 points, they're going to hurry up a little bit. So neutral game script means within seven points on either side. You're either down seven or less, or you're up seven or fewer. I like that little fucking switch up, less or fewer. The high-risk vocabulary is getting thrown out left and right. Neutral game script pace rank. 2020, they ranked 22nd in the NFL. 2019, 24th in the NFL. 2018, 18th in the NFL. So always in the bottom half, usually in the bottom 10 or 8 in terms of neutral game script pace rank. So with a more up-tempo offense, we could start to imagine a high-volume DK Metcalf. I mean, their actions this offseason dictate that they're going more in the direction of a pass-heavy offense, right? They draft Dwayne Eskridge in the second round, they sign Gerald Everett, and they let Carlos Hyde walk. Those things dictate to you that they are starting to consider the passing game a high priority here. I don't have to sit here and talk about Russ and how he's passed for 31 or more touchdowns in four straight years despite seeing volume close to the fucking mute button. But here's a chart anyways, okay? I wanted to look at 
because something that's that's relatively sticky or where you can kind of project to the, the passing touchdown numbers for a quarterback is the touchdown rate here. OK, that's the column in yellow. And these are Russell Wilson's touchdown rate numbers. So just the percentage of his overall throws that have gone for touchdowns over the last four years, 7.2 percent last year, 6 percent in 2019. And I want you I want you to keep in mind, these numbers are all these are top five numbers in the NFL year in and year out. Six percent of your passes going for touchdowns will usually be around, you know, number five or four in the NFL in terms of passing rate. So even when you see six, it's only seeming low because 7.2 and 8.2 are so fucking high. Those I'm pretty sure that it led the league both of those years. 7.2, 6%, 8.2, 6.1%. So the average there is 6.9%. And if we get normal Wilson efficiency, meaning touchdown rate, normal, plus more volume, we're looking at an unbelievable fantasy year, which is what the rest of the chart kind of dictates for you. Okay. So projected pass attempts in 2021. I think last year he had 558, I want to say. I think that's why I used that in the first column. Um, so we're projecting more this year. If we project more and more up-tempo, so we look at 558, and then we just look at some arbitrary numbers, 575, 600, 650, pass touchdowns at 6% touchdown rate, which was his lowest number of the last four years. You're looking at 33, 35, 36, 39. If we want to get generous and go up to the to the average, right? If we just go uh, the average touchdown rate over the last four years, 6.9%, and he stays at 558 pass attempts, you're still looking at 38 passing touchdowns. If he starts to shoot up a little bit more in volume, we could see 40, 41, 45, 48. In an insanely, insanely efficient year. I know we've been hoping about this forever, but this feels like the first time in the offseason where like the vibe actually matches up with with what we want to happen. Not not every word out of camp is about establishing the ground game. Again, if Wilson pops off, who's going to benefit most? Probably the 6'3, 228 pound, 23 year old coming into his prime third year of NFL experience with uh, F F elite athleticism, explosiveness attached to one of the most accurate deep passers in the history of the NFL. So again, this is the elite upside video, not what's most likely to happen. Most likely we're going to be sitting here in the summer of 2022 and saying the same fucking thing that we we're saying right now that we're hoping Wilson gets that volume bump. But if it happens, Metcalf goes absolutely fucking nuclear. Okay. Sorry. That was a long one on DK. Again, if, if you're enjoying the video, always hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you're new, we go, we go in depth on these players like this in every fucking video, six days, eight days a week. Let's move on to maybe not one single player, but I want to talk about the Dallas Cowboys offense. And I don't think we're properly rating just how high this volume can be and how mediocrely efficient these wide receivers need to be in order to be really good at fantasy based on the volume. Maybe the DAC propaganda has slowly morphed into hyperbole at this point based on like the five game sample size we saw last year. But the bigger thing here, to be completely honest, is not really whether or not like Dak Prescott is an elite passer. The reason we are so sure about the Cowboys offense being high powered outside of just the personnel that they have, which is fucking fantastic, is the sample size that we have of Kellen Moore taking over as the offense coordinator in 2019. The pace of his offense was just a straight fucking sprint. It was second highest pace in the NFL in 2019. But it wasn't a full season, so we we're looking at the sample size and we're like, okay, you know, we've also optimistically projected small sample sizes of coaches to to be the same thing last year and have those projections and get excited like fucking Freddie Kitchens for example, right? And then that was a disaster. You come into 2020 and we're hoping that Kellen Moore stays around. He does. They resign him and we're hoping that they run at the same pace that he did the previous year. And we looked at 2020 and that's exactly what happens. So you look at the pace. This is per football outsiders. Dallas's pace in terms of second per play first overall, second per play in the first half, second per play in the second half. You know, you look at all of these things across the board and they basically lead the NFL in pace in every statistical category. We should have zero questions about the pace of this offense. And that's what makes this Cowboys offense such a lock to have an unbelievably high floor. And we try to predict two things in fantasy football. We try to predict volume and we try to predict efficiency. And we already have one side of the equation figured out. We have the volume side figured out and it is really fucking high, which again gives you that super safe floor. But if the efficiency of these pass catchers and the efficiency of Dak is even a little bit above average, like let alone top five, if he actually performs like an elite player or any of these wide receivers perform like elite players, it's going to be record set across the board. We want to look back at last year. Dak played five games, okay? And we're going to discount week five because he left. So we have four full games of where he's a starter and he played the full game. His pace was literally 804 pass attempts, 548 completions, or you could look at that from a wide receiver perspective, 548 receptions, 6,770 passing yards, 36 pass touchdowns. So I wanted to do a chart similar to what we just did with uh, Seattle and Russell Wilson. And we go to Dak Prescott in 2020 based on 650 pass. Here's the thing. Like it, it's insane to assume 804 pass attempts. Like there's no fucking way that that's going to happen, but it's fun. So we put it on the chart as the last column there. You can see 804. It's the darkest green. And what I wanted to do was take 
four different pass attempt totals. Okay. So the yellow is 650. The light green is 700, then goes 750, 804, which was, was on pace for last year. So we want to take somewhere in between there to get a, a realistic look based on the pace, but based on what we've seen the last couple of years of how high volume this could be. And then all the way on the left side, you see the target share. So I'm looking at these different, these different receivers and I'm thinking, okay, if someone has 15% target share in this volume of pass attempts, 16.5%, 19%, 22%, 25%, how many targets will that equate to on the year. So we're just messing around. And for reference, last year, you could see this chart, uh, the entirety of the, the 2020 season, Michael Gallup had a 17.2% target share, CD Lamb at 177 Amari Cooper at 21.1. And if you look at the four full games with Dak, 10% for Michael Gallup, 13.9 for CD Lamb, 24.4 for Amari Cooper. So that's where I base the target share numbers off of, you know, just the overall 2020 season, four games with Dak. So I wanted to find somewhere in the middle ground just to give you arbitrary target share numbers and what those target numbers were going to be based on uh, overall pass attempts. And as you go across the target numbers, across the screen, if he has 700 pass attempts and a wide receiver has 19% of the targets, which is not really even that high of a number. A lot of wide receiver twos and offenses, some wide receiver threes and offenses have 19% of the targets. That's going to be 100 and 33 targets okay so if we're looking at amari cooper at 24.4 percent of the targets in the four games that dak threw last year look at what 20 look between 22 and 25 percent of the target share in this offense will do as the total pass attempt numbers go up like insane if amari cooper has 165 targets his upside is for sure elite if he if they do for some fucking reason throw the ball 804 times and he has 22 percent of those it's 177 he can go over 200 targets obviously it's wildly optimistic very unlikely to happen. But listen, if CeeDee Lamb and Amari Cooper both settle between 19 and 22 targets and they are in the 700 and 750 pass attempt range, they're both looking at like 140 to 150 targets. Big, big fucking numbers. So the key point to take away here, Cooper was the has been the apple of Dak's eye, right? If we're going to get the volume out of that passing offense that we think we're going to get, the target shares don't even need to be in the upper, upper echelon with this type of volume. Is Cooper, if Cooper can stay healthy for the year, which is seeming to be already a fucking issue, the volume upside is elite, all right? If something is fucked up with Cooper's foot or ankle, CD Lamb, volume could be elite. Uh, like legitimately 11 to 12 targets per game out of the slot, all right? So at this point, we simply have a big enough sample size with this offense running under Kellen Moore, the volume, the pace, the up-tempo, to know that that's what they're, that's what they're about, right? We're not projecting off an eight-game sample size anymore. We're projecting off of a fucking 24-game sample size. And the pace has been exactly the same throughout, and it's really, really straight sprint which means the volume is going to be known to a reasonable degree so those are just like the guys overall that i'm talking about for elite upside right we have calvin ridley we've got the three middle round guys in metcalf aj brown justin jefferson and then we've got this dallas offense amari cooper cd lamb some honorable mentions though it's tough because the middle tiers of guys you like to have on your team that you like to draft are usually stuck in some sort of timeshares or they're just a high-end wide receiver too that might have better teammates. You're talking about Tampa Bay, you're talking about Tyler Lockie, you're talking about you know Adam Thielen, the Carolina wide receivers. I think Cooper Cup has massive touchdown upside in 2021, which means overall that he has massive upside overall for fantasy. And I know a lot of people love Robert Woods' upside with Matthew Stafford here, and rightfully so, but Cup is two years removed or a year removed basically from being a wide receiver four in fantasy. Woods is the same player year in and year out, and it does not come with much upside, okay? This is a tweet I put out a couple weeks ago. Make sure you're following me on Twitter if you're not already. Robert Woods' fantasy finishes over the last four years in half PPR, fantasy points per game. Wide receiver 19, wide receiver 17, wide receiver 17, wide receiver 18. So it feels like Woods and Cup continue to get lumped in together in the same fantasy tier in terms of like where you should be drafting him. But for me, Cup just has a much, much higher ceiling because of the touchdown upside. Like we've seen him have a double digit touchdown upside ceiling. No more Cam Akers could mean more targets for Cooper Cup in the red zone as well. So I really like Cooper Cup. Last honorable mention here, Devonta Smith in Philly, man. I really think this guy is going to set the world ablaze as a rookie. Uh, there's absolutely a world where Jalen Hurts flames out and just stinks as an NFL passer. But there's two sides to every coin, man. And uh, one of them reads Hurts is, is better. And he becomes a good NFL passer. And if that's the case, it's, again, wheels the fuck up for Devontae Smith. I think he'll take over as the wide receiver one uh, immediately, if not the offensive player, number one in this offense. And the separation he creates, uh, I think, will just warrant a zillion targets. Again, going back to the reception perception by Matt Harmon, he does college prospects as well. And first thing he said in Devonta Smith's profile was by far and away the best separating in this class. No question about it. Maybe he doesn't have elite upside. But I think a thousand receiving yards in his rookie year is elite upside. And I think uh, I won't be surprised at all if he sees 110 to 120 targets this year, tops a thousand yards as a rookie. And that is a fantastic seventh, eighth, ninth round pick, someone with much higher upside than giving credit for at the moment. All right. 
Let me know who you guys think has a lead upside. Obviously, Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, those guys, Stephon Diggs even. You can throw them into there, but I didn't want to bore you with, uh, with players everybody knows about. So I just put Calvin Ridley on the list because none of you guys know about him. That's it for today's video, though. Uh, again, if you enjoy the video, thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We do deep dives like this literally every single day. We do uh, Q&A questions if you have any about your dynasty team, your fantasy team, every Saturday on our Q&A Salt series. That is available only to the Patreons, patreon.com forward slash B-D-G-E. That'll get you access to a whole bunch of shit, too. A bunch of perks on there that'll be listed on the site. Go sign up there. That's it. I love y'all. I'm out. Thank <laughs> you.